Welcome to Media in the Mix, the only podcast produced and hosted by the School of Communication at American University. Join us as we create a safe space to explore topics and communication at the intersection of social justice, tech, innovation, and pop culture. Today, we have the absolute pleasure of speaking with Derek McGinty, who is also an SOC alum. Just to give you a little background, Derek McGinty is a journalist, an award-winning interviewer, and a commentator. He got his first job on the air back in 1984 at WHUR Radio in Washington, D.C. From there, he went to WAMU-FM, where he launched a nationally syndicated daytime talk show on NPR. By the end of the century, he had been a correspondent on the CBS broadcast Public Eye with Brian Gumbel and HBO's Real Sports with Brian Gumbel. After two years in New York as anchor of ABC's World News Now and World News This Morning, it was back to his hometown of Washington, D.C. to anchor WUSA's fledgling 7 p.m. local newscast. Derek, thank you so much for being here and joining us on the podcast today. It's great to be with you. Thank you. So let's get right into it. So one of the things you're involved in at SOC is the Alumni Mentorship Program and being a mentor. This is something that we've had going on for a while, and it's where our SOC alum come together as mentors for our SOC students who are our mentees. And it's just a time where we can build relationships, help each other out. Number one, what do you think the benefit of giving back as an alumni is? And what motivates you to do that? I find it to be the most fulfilling part of my career at this point. You know, you you do you work so hard, you're ambitious, you want to succeed, you want to you want to be promoted, you want to become bigger and, and more famous, I guess. And then there comes a time when you realize that it's not about you anymore, right? It's about the younger people that are coming along behind you. And to me, the most the most valuable thing you can do is pass on your knowledge and hopefully your experiences that. And, and the lessons that you've learned that could perhaps make somebody else's journey a little easier. Mm-hmm. That makes a lot of sense. And what do you think makes for a good mentor, first and foremost? Well, first and foremost is just the availability and, and willingness to do it, right? Mm-hmm. You, just, you know, I get uh, an email from a young person who says, hey, I'm your new mentee. You know, when can we talk? And I say, here's my number. Call me anytime, you know? And sometimes we'll get together, but most, most, many times we won't. We'll have phone calls or you know, we'll have lunch or something at some point, but getting together is not the most important thing. The most important thing is, again, the passing on of of the knowledge. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I know these students are very busy, right? So, you know, you got to kind of work around their schedule. You have to be available to them. That's the most important thing. Definitely. And like you said, I think it is a two-way street. Uh, Whether you're wanting to be a mentor or a mentee, I think the willingness to do it and want to do it has to be there. Otherwise, like it it cannot be just a one-way street. And adding on to that, just for any of our students or mentors listening to this, uh, do you have any tips, things maybe to do, things not to do? That's an important one as well. No, things not to do. Don't waste my time. Mm -hmm. I had an experience once with a young lady who was sent to me. Well, I wasn't part of a program. Somebody just said, hey, will you talk to my friend who wants to get in the business? And I always say yes. You know, but, you know, she, she would you call her back. She wouldn't return calls, you know, and after three or four times of this, well, then I can't work with you anymore. Right. Because, you know, so don't waste my time. That's the most important thing. It's a mentee. You're going to make mistakes and we all understand that mm-hmm. we all. But but don't don't waste my time. Don't not show up. Don't. Right. You know, these are the things that to me say, first of all, you're not going to be good in the business if that's how you're going to continue to behave. Things aren't going to go your way. Yes. But secondly, you're, you know, I mean, I, I don't say it like this, but the mentor is doing you a favor, right? You're coming to somebody who may, may or may not still be working, but they probably got a lot on their plate and they're doing you a favor. So like it. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. And that's something that uh, one of my first mentors in the industry was actually my professor who I was a graduate assistant to at SOC, which was Russell Williams. And he told me that everything starts from even just reaching out and sending that email. Everything, the way you write the email, how you respond, um, when you respond, if you respond. I mean, he's he outlined that, you know, all of those things start right when you make that connection right. and do you do you have do you, can you speak any truth to that i mean oh, when people and reach out to you do you take notice of those things oh, so, so, of course you know and you want to see if someone's business-like in their in the way they present themselves 
or do they seem at least look these are young people right they're still learning i don't expect you to be like you're 35 right. but you know i do expect you to have some idea of what it takes to be a professional and present yourself in a professional way mm-hmm. and that, that's all i'm asking and, right. and certainly if you ask me i'll tell you and that actually leads us into a good topic of networking. I've had a lot of conversations regarding networking with students, um, even just my own peers in the industry. And I think sometimes it can be a very daunting topic. So a lot of people think networking has to be very official and you have to be in a pantsuit and you have to give out your resume and your your business card and, you know, at a fancy event. And although those are very beneficial, and I think if you see those and they pertain to what you want to do in this industry, go to them and meet as many people as you can. But at the same time, I think networking can be just creating relationships and just listening to people. Uh, my best advice for people is to always memorize one fact about somebody. You know, if they if they mention that they love they love dolphins and they recently went swimming with the dolphins, the next time I see them, I'm going to make sure to ask, how was swimming with the dolphins? And when are you going to go do that again? Because I think no people really respond to that. You listened. It wasn't just about what can I do for you and what can you do for me? You know what, Grace? I am going to use that advice you just gave about memorizing one fact about a person. I'm going to use that. And you just mentored me. So they, thank you. Wow. That's like no, that means a lot. Thank like you. Uh, but no, it's important because I don't know if you agree, but I feel like sometimes it it is just about establishing a relationship and you don't want to make your mentor or mentee feel like it is just an exchange, you know, right. well, right. The, the tit for tat. If I'm going to do this, you're going to do that. Or if I'm giving you this, you got to give me that. I think sometimes that relationship it's, it's can sometimes be a friendship. And I think oh. it's more important for that long-term you know, you don't want to just three, four months have a relationship and then say, well, thank you for helping me. That's it now. You know, it, it right. is, it should be a nice relationship. Totally agree with you. And I've had a few mentees that have actually have become friends and we communicated, you know, uh, over a couple of years, you mm-hmm. know, now, you know, the reality is we, we, we were not in the same place, so we're not going to stay best besties, right. but you know, it's good to have that relationship where you continue to communicate and find out whether or not you know, they advance in their careers, you become friends. And, and one particular mentee I had, uh, he's such a great guy and he and I became friends. He now works at the Washington Post. And, you know, he had me over for dinner at his house and, and he and his wife, you know, uh, were very, 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 very yeah. nice. And so it was just, uh, it's, we've had a very good relationship. So I'm, I'm saying that to say that yes, you do become friends with these young people and that, and that's, and that's a wonderful thing. I love that. That's great. Also for our students, current students, and maybe even prospective students who are listening. So we do have a lot of experiential learning programs at SOC as well, but just to give you guys some background of a few. So we have New York intensive, LA intensive, where you're able to actually travel to these cities and meet, you know, networks, meet producers, meet directors, meet editors. I mean, whoever, and, and whatever you're looking to do in the industry, I guarantee you'll meet someone who's doing that. And also other other things right here on campus. For example, we have the SOC3, um, which just launched, which is with pa- uh, Professor Pallavi. And what these students do, which I think is so cool, I wish I had this, they go basically while simultaneously learning in the classroom about PR or strategic communications, they are also simultaneously working with real organizations in DC and actually putting PR into practice. So I think that's awesome. These students are getting real world experience while they're still in the classroom. Just in your opinion, how important do you think these types of programs are in regards to our students' success post-graduation? Well, I think they could be critical. I think that, you know, one of the biggest problems you have when you first come out of school is you don't know anything, right? right? You haven't done much. You know, I remember putting together a resume when I was 22 years old and had things like the student newspaper and the school radio station and these things. And, you know, people who work actually worked in the business don't care about that, right? right? To them, that's just very much a JV kind of experience that doesn't help you much in the quote unquote real world. Real world. So, yeah. you know, the fact that you can come in with experience where you actually did stuff mm-hmm. at an organization, at a news organization, that helps a lot because quite frankly, you know, internships are great and I definitely got my first job because I was at an internship, but it wasn't because of the stuff I was doing at the internship. It right. was because I was just in proximity. And, and, I, and I think a lot of internships, at least they used to be when I was coming up, you didn't get to necessarily do much that was significant. And right. so experiential learning, as you described, is a whole different step up from that. So I think it's great. I think it's perfect. And I think 
employers will be very happy to see somebody come in who actually knows something about what they do. Follow up on that. It, we had a podcast episode last week with one of our SOC alum who had just moved out to LA. He's a fresh grad. And he had nine internships under his belt. Wow. And the only position he was able to get while moving out to LA was another internship. That was the, he applied to full-time jobs, full-time jobs, full and the only position he got, and granted it was paid, it was, it basically was like a full-time job, only it was named internship. He said that he is so grateful that he got all those internships under his belt because on top of experiential learning, on top of extracurricular activities, he said that they wanted to, to see that you had that real world experience, that you were just around that environment. So can you speak to this idea that, you know, internships are still hold value? You know, it's been 40, more than 40 years since my last internship. Mm -hmm. I got to say the world is a lot different now than it was then. First of all, a lot of them pay now, which yes. in my day, they did not. Different. Right? They yeah. almost universally did not pay. Which and, is yeah. you know, you didn't necessarily get to do much, especially if you were in a big city in a, in a big newsroom, you were, you know, getting coffee for everybody. It yeah. wasn't, you were just glad to be there and you had mm -hmm. to be really aggressive to try to get something more out of it. You had to know what you wanted and go after it and talk to people and do it. You had to do all these things. The internship wasn't set up for you. I right. think these days the internships are set up to be a lot more beneficial. So that's, mm -hmm. a, that's a, that's a good thing. And you, you should still be aggressive. You should still be networking and talking to everybody you can, but at least if you go in there, you can be confident you're not going to learn, you know, how to get balance everybody's order from the bagel place. Right, <laughs> right. And that's so true. And I think it's cool just to, although I know some people today are still getting coffee and like that for film as a PA, like that's, that's where you start sometimes. You just gotta, yeah, <laughs> you gotta get coffee, you gotta yeah. get lunch, you gotta drive to go get batteries. Um, You know, oh, you those, know. those are the, the responsibilities that you have. It's, very cool because as long as you're around it, you don't know what you'll get to do, who you'll get to experience. I remember I was on one set and they had the tripods that they use here at SOC and they are very complicated tripods. I mean, they, uh. they are very complicated tripods. I didn't have experience with them other than being a student. And they asked anybody know how to use these tripods. And, you know, the little PA raised her hand and said, yes, I do. And that just that day made a huge difference. And I think the way people viewed me as a PA, because you just, you never know. You never know what question you'll be able to answer. You never know who you're going to meet. You never know, again, like those conversations, those friendships, you never know who you're going to have a conversation with. I think that's a great story. I think that everybody's experience is different mm -hmm. and everybody's got a different set of skills and everybody's right. internships, but you just, like you said, you just, you just never know. know. Let's talk about this idea of everyone has a beginning, middle, and end, but it's not always in that order. Especially in the pandemic, a lot of people, content creators, um, they had this overnight success that everyone's looking to thinking, oh, it's got to be that. It's just, if I don't have overnight success, I didn't make it. Thinking back to your own, I made it moments, you know, between your success now and, and that moment, how much time has passed? What's changed? Can you speak to this idea of beginning, middle, and end? Oh, my goodness. Well, you know, I would say my I made it moment, as you described, it was my first on air job, because up until then, I just didn't I wasn't sure that it was ever going to happen. Mm -hmm. And I had been working. I worked at, you know, WTOP for a couple of years as a news writer, which I think is a job they don't even have anymore. And um, certainly they don't have those manual typewriters anymore. And, um, you know, I was working at United Press International Wire Service, which no longer exists, right? So <laughs> I, I just didn't know if, if it was ever going to, if I was ever going to get on the air. And when I got the job at WHUR and I actually had my first on-air, uh, you know, appearance, that was a big deal, mm -hmm. right? That was a big deal. So that would be sort of my, oh, maybe this is going to work out kind of moment, you yeah. know? And so that's what I would say. Uh, in terms of that. Was there ever a moment like an internship you had or what was the first moment you kind of stepped into this industry thinking like, oh, this is what I want to do? Because I remember I had a, a quick summer job at uh, WHUT, Howard University Television yeah, Station. Know, know and well. yeah, and it was really fun. For three months, I worked just honestly, it was a PA role. I was doing a lot of random things, but I just wanted to be around it because I was like, if I can be around it, I could see whether I like this or not, just the environment, the pace. And then when I saw them, that first live show that they did, 
and producers were in that room and the control room. And there's just the energy in there. Do you remember a moment like that? You know, it's interesting. I decided I wanted to be in news when I was 16 years old. Wow. And the late, great Jim Vance, who mm -hmm. used to be the anchor, longtime anchor here in Washington at NBC4, mm -hmm. great man. He came to my high school. And he's talked about, he, he, he had an assembly in the auditorium and he talked about the news business and how good it was. And my light went on. And I said, that's what I want to do. That's, and then I never wavered. Now, I did think I was going to be a, 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 a newspaper reporter for, the, you know, for a while. I did that my first three years at, a, at AU and then changed my major to broadcast the last year. Mm -hmm. But I never wavered in terms of wanting to be in news. I, I thought the storytelling and writing were things that I really wanted to be, wanted to be a part of. That's and awesome. That was, that was how it happened. So your advice, let's say someone who says, oh, I know I want to be in film. Well, film can mean a lot of different things, mm -hmm. right? And that's the problem. So, right? right. So do you recommend, you know, not necessarily pigeonholing yourself to one thing, getting that experience under your belt if you get those opportunities? Well, I would say yes and no. I mean, if you are sure that this one area is what you want to focus on, you want to make movies, right? Or you, you want to edit or you, you want to be a broadcaster, whatever it is, you're sure that that's your thing mm -hmm. Then focus on it as soon as you can. Because the big mistake some people make is getting sidetracked on something else. And then they're doing that and then they begin to get promoted and doing better at that. And it's not really what they want. So then it's hard to go back down to the beginning to go back up again. So mm -hmm. if you know what you want, go after it. You yeah. know, don't, don't be diverted into other things, you know, because that can mess you up. Yeah. Russell used to say, if the naysayers could talk you out of what you're doing, then you weren't meant to do it in the first well, place. Oh, I like that. That's so, good. Yeah. I, I try to remember that too. Don't let people make you think that you can't do it or yeah. that you should. I always go back to the story about Katie Kirk when she was at CNN supposedly and some guy, some broadcast, some uh, executive told her, you'll never make it in this business, right? Mm -hmm. no. I think she did. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. So last thing here, I want to talk. I read uh, something on your website that I just thought, would be very interesting to kind of dive into. Okay. Um, so it says, Derek has believed that ideas matter more than ideology. Can you just explain that a little bit more? I came to understand when I was a talk show host, where I was talking to all different kinds of people with varying points of view, that ideas could bridge the gap, right, between people, that, that, that we could talk about, instead of talking about I'm a Republican or I'm a Democrat or I'm a red state or blue state person. This is what I believe. These are the things that are important to me. This is how I want to get there. And then we can have a conversation about whether that, that it's right or wrong or, or, or misguided or not. But when you have an ideology, that locks you in, right? So then you, if, I'm, if I'm a Republican and I, and I see a Democrat, then maybe I want to have a, an argument. But the ideas that we have may not be that different. Mm -hmm. And so... That's what we can always discuss ideas. Ideology is, is more difficult. You know, I just never wanted to be locked in. I always said, say what you think mm -hmm. and be prepared to defend it yeah. and be prepared to change your mind if someone comes up with something better, yeah. right? And that, and that to me is about ideas, not ideology. Yeah. If, I'm, if, I, if I'm an ideologue, maybe I don't change my mind no matter what the argument yeah. is. You know, yeah. I'm just saying, if people get mad, so what? I don't I care. Know. You know I what? Know. You're better off being courageous. Yes. You know, and especially if you can justify sometimes. what you say. Yeah. Right. If you if someone comes yeah. in and says, well, this is why I said this. And it made sense. Now you're yeah. telling me why it doesn't. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, if then it's like, okay, you're right. I'm wrong. Yeah. That's so true. The best thing I heard recently, especially in this day and age, with everything going on, is that the best thing you could do is stick to the side, stick to what you believe, but be willing to listen and hear the completely opposite side. If, if you can do that and you could kind of be on that same page, you know, uh, I think it'll bring a, or actually people might realize they have a lot more in common than they, I, they, I, <laughs> they realize, certainly, you know, certainly true, certainly true. And, and, you know, we have to reach a point where we can at least discuss things. I, I, I kind oh, of that's, yes. despair about where we are right now, where, where there's like no conversations, just yeah. shouting past each other. I don't think that's helpful, but yeah, I'm not and, in charge. 
do you encourage people still to have those difficult conversations? Because I know there's a fine line nowadays between I'm too scared to say something or I'm too scared to speak on something or or maybe we, you know, what's your, especially someone coming from like a news, the news field, you know, where that's that's the basis of it is having difficult conversations and, and bringing up topics that maybe we don't usually want to you know, talk about on the day to day. It depends, you know, in, in the real world, sometimes it's just not worth it. Mm-hmm. You know, you're like, man, this is going to be a big fight. I, I don't care enough about this. Yeah. Thing. You That's know, so real. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Get into it with you. You know, we're, we're right. having a nice time here. Let's just keep keep the peace. Right. You know, and so mm-hmm. that's the that's the issue, I think. I mean, you have to be worth it to have the argument. I'm disappointed that, you know, there's no debate anymore. There's nobody saying these are the reasons I think this. Right. But what are your reasons for disagreeing with, me? Mm-hmm. you know? Or I disagree with you, but you're not a bad person. Right. Or, you or know, we can, I mean, we can have a conversation things. on it. Yeah, but we, you know, that's yeah. not. So we, we all try to, I think, if we're, we're, we're a gracious person, you try to have grace for the people around you, understanding that you're going to need some grace too. Yes, 100%. Pun intended. Have grace for yourself and for everyone. Else. Oh, yeah. yeah. I didn't even, <laughs> <laughs> I just I didn't even think in. about that. That's funny. <laughs> Thank you so much, Derek, for being here. This was an awesome conversation. I appreciate you, Grace. Thanks for having me. Thank you. And everyone who is listening, you could check out our bi-weekly episodes dropping on Wednesdays on Anchor, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts. If you'd like to support this podcast and the School of Communication, go to giving.americans.edu to donate now. And that's a wrap.